I'm Encore Delight. I'm Shannon Hayes. I'm Lisa Peterson, and you're listening to the Earn and Invest Podcast. When I set out on my career path, purpose was front and center. My dad died when I was seven years old, and I wanted to be just like him. He was a doctor, so I would become one. Decades later, I found myself enmeshed in a profession and business that provided me sufficient cash, but I had lost my sense of purpose. A victim of burnout, I no longer felt the deep connections to medicine that I dreamed about as a child. Fortunately, the boon of financial independence allowed me to leave my medical business in order to pursue purpose, which included creating this podcast, but I could do so without the economic dictates of making a living. Not everyone is that lucky. Business, money, purpose. Purpose, money, business. How do they fit together? And more importantly, should they? Encore Delight is the creator and host of the 10,000 Heroes podcast, whose mission is to inspire you to explore your own definition of a hero and then live it. He is also the founder of the Holistic Leadership Club and has spent time as a hospice chaplain. Shannon Hayes holds a PhD in sustainable agriculture and community development from Cornell University and a bachelor's in creative writing from Birmingham University. She's the author of seven books, including The Grass-Fed Gourmet, Radical Homemakers, and Redefining Rich. Lisa Peterson is a certified financial planner and has an MBA in finance from Cal State. She is the author of The Mindful Millionaire and creator of WealthClinic.com. Ankur, Shannon, and Lisa, welcome to Earn and Invest. Ankur, I, I want to begin with you. We're talking today about purposeful entrepreneurship. And yet, a few years ago, I remember there was a backlash in the media about pursuing one's passion in the workplace and maybe how it was inappropriate. In light of today's discussion, I guess a big question are, are the words purpose and passion interchangeable? Ah. <sighs> uh. That's that's an interesting distinction, and I, I you know there's those words can be defined in so many different ways. So I'll I'll draw a little distinction now, and we'll see if that's helpful. For me, I, I would say the purpose that I'm encouraging people to get in touch with is something that is large enough that it can contain many different passions, many different activities, and many different forms, and yet is something that is specific enough to the in- individual. That it, that it stays more or less in integrity or constant throughout someone's life. So we may discover it more and more as we continue growing, but it's something that is some part of our, of our being, or something like that. And so it, it can contain many passions. So, you know, with that in mind, yeah, I, I could see how depending on how you're expressing your purpose at any given moment, a certain passion may or not fit with that. And I would put the emphasis on really a, a deeper exploration of what is our individual purpose rather than just the more hedonic idea of pursuing one's passion at any given moment in time. Yeah, it, it's an interesting idea, Ankara, because I'm based on your answer, I'm thinking of like the big purpose bubble and you have much smaller passion bubbles in there and, and maybe some non-passion bubbles that still have importance to you. Lisa, broaden that discussion. I mean, you talk a lot about mindfulness. Where does mindfulness play into this idea of passion and purpose? Well, I think going back to this idea of disagreement with, you know, purpose and passion being so important and people bucking up against that, what I have come to see is that there are two ways of looking at the world and the decisions that we make. One is a place coming from a place of scarcity and the other is coming from a place of abundance. And so I think that the reason there's a backlash with this idea of purpose and passion is most people are looking at the world through the lens of scarcity. What can I get out of it? Because there's a fear that there isn't enough to go around. It's very oriented to, I've got to make a certain amount of money. I've got to take care of myself and my family. That's all that matters. It isn't this discussion of purpose and passion. And so from a place of abundance, those who are receptive to it, those who are open to it, realize that the only way you're going to live a life that you really enjoy is by looking at 
how do these things play into what you're doing in your career, what you're doing in your life? And to me, you know, purpose and passion are everything. Lisa, I want to go further into this idea of scarcity and abundance. You know, it hits me that the three of you on this panel are highly educated people who went to some of the best universities in the United States. You have an MBA, Lisa. Let's talk about academics. Do you think it adds to the scarcity mindset? I mean, is that maybe some of the academic influence? Explain that a little further. I guess when I'm thinking about all three of you, I feel like all three of you have degrees from impressive universities, some advanced degrees. You even got an MBA. But my suspicion is that academics or specifically the university degrees inform what you do day to day today less than you thought it would. So it hits me that there are a lot of people out there who are operating and building businesses with this idea of scarcity instead of the more abundant and certainly more purposeful mindset that I think we're going to talk about today. And I'm wondering kind of the academic influence on that. Is this something MBA schools and maybe PhD schools are teaching us? Most definitely. I think that the idea of the core idea of economics is based on a system of scarcity. And how do you respond to this idea that there's only so much and you've got to get your part. And so the models are informing us to think a certain way of dealing with obstacles and, and, um, you know, challenges that we that we experience in the day to day real life experience. It's not that we're ignoring those things, but the problem is, is there's no other alternative being presented, which is how could I maybe think of things differently? And I want to be clear when I say abundance, I'm not coming from a place of saying, you know, there's just more and more and more. It's not all about that, right? Sometimes people misunderstand, at least from the way I look at it. It's about what happens when you don't come at the world from scarcity, like like what happens to the, your thoughts and your mind when you think there is more than enough to go around? How do we solve problems from that place? Like this idea that we can take care of everybody on the planet, that there is enough resource. How do we inform ourselves rather than the, the scarcity of like, the very egoic, I've got to take care of myself. I've got to take care of my company. It doesn't matter what happens to anyone else. That's scarcity. And that's the problem that I see causes a lot of the pain and suffering in the world is we're not working together to say, what's another alternative? How do we actually help one another? Shannon, as you listen to Lisa speak about abundance and scarcity, as I recall, you hit that place in your academic career also, right? You were at one point thinking that you were going to live the academic life. You were getting a PhD, you were studying sustainability. A far cry from what you eventually decided to do. Were you noticing some of these same problems in academics that Lisa's talking about? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I was observing in academia. Well, for one thing, I was studying sustainability in academia, and I was coming from this small farm life that I'm currently living now. And I began to realize that the belief that I was buying into was that the only way I could stay in touch with the small farm life um, was to be in academia and to fight for the narrowing window of positions that would be available that would enable me to study what I truly cared about, which was the sustainability of the small farm and my concerns that the small farm life is disappearing and that the rural life that I really value that works in harmony with the environment and and the community is all going away. And so when I realized that sort of academia was pushing me into this window where I would teach about how we're losing these things, (laughs) rather than just sort of walking away and saying, wait a minute, I want these things to be a reality. So rather than spending my life uh, trying to hold down an academic position um, where I teach about the importance of these things and how awful it is that we're losing them, I'm going to step out of that and make the things that I want to succeed, succeed. And I came at it with this view of, you know, I'm tired of these teachings that this is a hard way of life, that we can't make it. I'm going to show that this really is something that's valuable. And not only is it something valuable 
but I can really change the world by doing that. And so, yeah, I had to, I had to walk away from it. It's that scarcity mindset. A lot of times we think scarcity, but we have to remember that's a fearful mindset too. If you want to save small farms and save the environment as I wanted to do, then why would I want to be teaching in a classroom and telling other kids how dire the situation is? How about I go out and, and really make something work and make something vibrant and then um, share that instead? And that took getting rid of that fear rather than saying the only way I'm going to survive, as Lisa says, you know, take care of me and, and meet that purpose is by having a job rather than doing that. Why don't I face exactly what I want and put that fear behind me and come forward with living my beliefs instead? Encore, as I listen to Lisa and Shannon and what I know of you too, it seems like we're all interested in this idea of uh, creating a life of wealth. But maybe we define that a little different than other people do. First and foremost, do you think in society today that we kind of confabulate this idea with wealth and money? Yeah, I, I think a lot of our terms around wealth and around money are really are really confused. Even like f- for me, the idea of wealth is based upon the idea of enoughness. That there's, that there's no sense of feeling wealth without knowing what the boundary conditions are, like what is enough, which is why so many people who have a lot of some resource, whether it's money or whether it's time, or even whether it's human relationships, can feel a sense of poverty because there's not a definition of like, what do I actually want? What is actually enough? And like what Lisa was saying, you know, the, they're operating in conditions of competition for resources, you know, c- conditions of scarcity. And sometimes that's real. Sometimes there are scarce resources around us. And sometimes that's just in our mind. It's important for me to understand those distinctions and have the right attitude in the right situation. Shannon, it hits me as we talk about enough that when I talk to you on this podcast about your book, Redefining Rich, we talked about this idea that many years, Saplish Hollow Farms, and the associated businesses produced maybe $40,000 or less. On the other hand, you were building kind of this financial independence model, saving money and investing. Talk about how you, in light of what you do for a living at Satbush Farms, what do you consider makes that life wealthy? That I came in from the woods to have (laughs) this conversation today. (laughs) Um, it is really easy when you're a small farmer, there's a joke in the small farm community. This is, if you want a wine cellar, put a whole bunch of farmers down in a basement. Okay. (laughs) We, we, uh, are conditioned to talk about how we're victimized and marginalized in society. This is how I grew up as a farmer. And when I stepped into the helm of my family's business and came to the helm where three generations working together, that really, that, that mentality was weighing me down. And I had to disappear for a couple of days because it just got to be, the burden got to be so much. How do I deal with aging parents and their health issues and all the bills that have to get paid and the payroll that has to be met and the productivity that has to happen? Uh, Because this isn't fair. This life is stacked against me. And I had to just disappear into the woods and, and sit with these trials for a while. And when I did, I realized what I told you about a couple minutes ago, where I said, um, this is a problem that I care about. This is, this is a fixation, a fascination and a passion. And then I realized that means the problem itself, the fascinating problem that it's hard to make a living on a family farm is why I'm here. So that actually became one of the para- my parameters of wealth is the fascinating problem, the intriguing work. And it continues to be that way. I mean, boy, I face all kinds of myriad problems every single day. <laughs> and you can really get beaten down or you can say, dude, that is why I am here. I am here because it is so fascinating. I am here because my husband and I were just sitting in the woods beside a a pond for two hours 
talking about our problems and not talking about our problems because we're going, whoa, it's me. We're talking about our problems because it's so fascinating to take them apart, to discuss the, the, the facets of them, to come up with solutions, to be creative. And that's what we thrive on. That's what our relationship you know, really jives on is how do we come up with an interesting solution? And it's what our whole family gets together and talks about. So the problem itself that we're tackling is part of the wealth. And it starts there. And then all those other things, the, the, the fact that I get to work with my family, that I get to be in touch with the earth and um, drinking pure, clean water and eating great food, all of those things make the real wealth for me. And then the money just becomes a tool for transactions. Lisa, it's clear to me that when we define wealth and define enough solely on monetary means, I think that's a lot of that scarcity that you were talking about before. But realistically, businesses need to make a certain amount of money to support themselves. What we're all talking about here is being more purposeful in our entrepreneurship. Do you think being a purposeful entrepreneur makes your business more successful? And I guess we'd have to define successful, right? Are we talking about economically, which is important, or are we talking about emotionally? Maybe talk about aspects of both. Do you think being a purposeful entrepreneur makes a business more successful, either economically or emotionally or both? <laughs> it's such a good question. I feel like I explore this on a daily basis. Uh, you know, my first response, the, the most simple would be, it doesn't make it easier. It doesn't make it easier from a success standpoint and maybe even from a meaning standpoint. And the reason I say that is because I spend more of my time questioning assumptions than anything in all that I do. And that's not easy because a lot of times I'm so conditioned by the system that I've been raised in that I can't tell the difference of like what's scarcity and what's abundance. And that adds time to the projects that I work on. A lot of my stuff is, is teaching people about business, teaching people about their relationship with money. And I have to, I spend a lot of time checking, am I in alignment? Because is this just conditioned systems that are affecting what I'm teaching? Or am I actually free from the matrix, if you will, and really teaching something that's deeply valuable and meaningful to people? So um, I have seen my peers who started businesses back in 2014, similar to myself, who weren't necessarily asking themselves these questions. And I've seen them go on to make multiple seven figures in their businesses. Whereas because money wasn't the reason I was starting my business, um, it was more of exploring these conversations and helping people who might not have money or have struggled with money and their relationship with it for their whole life. That hasn't been my story in my business. I often saw choices. I was like, yeah, I can make a lot more money doing this, but this has more meaning. And, and for me, that is like, like we've already discussed success. But I've had to redefine success in my in my business and feel really good about it and be able to say this is enough over and over again, even though there are times where I'm like, okay, what am I doing wrong? You know, like I I forget, I get lost in in the com competition or, you know, like I teach people how to have a happier relationship with money and that's really meaningful, but it's just not work that happens overnight. It, it takes time and I've got to be patient with that process. So that's, that's my take. Ankur, they're trade-offs, right? I mean, as Lisa was saying, it's not easy to bring purpose into your business model. Let's explore that by turning it around and looking at the other side. What happens when you build a business solely based on economic returns? Why isn't that just good enough. Yeah. So, you know, we, we can refer back to this. It's almost like a trope now in this world, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs <laughs> where you, where you have like, you have different levels of satisfaction in different areas of your life. And it's, it's just essential for most of us to be able to eat, you know, unless you're on some kind of extended fasting program and it's essential to have physical, physical security. But as you meet those basic needs, we want more. We want emotional fulfillment. We want meaning. We want to understand our potential. We want self-actualization. And having a successful, in the economic sense, business 
gets us only so far up that pyramid. It only meets certain needs and it won't meet our deepest, most intrinsic and highest needs. So that's that's the danger. But that's why many people, like yourself included, you'll hit those first few layers, you'll feel a sense of liberation and then be like, oh, great. Now I can do something else and I can pursue these other avenues. My, my personal belief and my hope is that our economy is, is it's like, um, it's, in, it's in a developmental, it's a developmental arc. And our economy, I'm going to say it's like, it's like we're in preschool right now. <laughs> and the economy of the future, I don't know if it'll be in 50 years or 100 years or 5,000 years. The, the whole point of it, it's my friend Matt is always impressing upon me this, this, this vision and it's so helpful. The whole point is to help organize in like a free flowing and decentralized way. That's what the market is so good at our highest contribution towards society. And that's clearly not what's happening right now, <laughs> but that's where I, that's where I think it's going. And that's how I want to act. You know, that's how I want to like work with people to be like, imagine if it's possible to do that right now, like how can you correspond your actions, your beliefs, the best way that you think your individual reality can contribute to the people around you. And it's, I don't think it's true in all cases, but look for a place in which that would also meet your economic needs. Listening to Ankur, I'm reminded, Shannon, of something that we say a lot in healthcare, especially in the hospice world, because that's what I'm involved in, is they often say there is no mission without margin. Talk to me about walking that line in your business. Is that something you're constantly bumping up against? Maybe there is no margin without mission. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, certainly you could turn around, right? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I mentioned we have the farm. I also have the cafe and the vacation rentals and all these different things that we do. And I am always in a position, different things return different things economically. You would think, for example, the actual um, raising chickens is a great example this year. I, uh, the farm produces about a thousand meat birds per year. Right now, grain prices are skyrocketing. Fuel prices are skyrocketing. And um, we are also dealing with in, in the Northeast and across the country, avian flu. So the margin in chicken this year is very minimal, but I have a customer base of a few hundred customers who count on me to grow their food. And what's happening this year, not only that, but every single one of these customers, our customers are not affluent. They're really feeling the pinch in their grocery bills. They're feeling the pinch in their gas bills, but they've made a commitment to me. They made a commitment to me before all these things skyrocketed that they're going to buy my food. They, they purchased their shares up front. Is there margin in chickens this year? No, no, but I keep a diverse line of businesses and um, the mission of the business, the foundation of the farm is the, the, the soil and the water and the food that we produce. I have other businesses like vacation rentals that have easy margins. Growing chickens this year? No. The price of the chicken stays the same. The customers who committed at those prices, they will have their food for winter based on that. So is there margin? No. Is there mission? Yes. And even though that the chickens are going to be a loss this year, they are still producing wealth for the farm. They are contributing to the soil fertility, the biodiversity of the chickens interacting on the pastures with the sheep. The chickens are going through and they're picking through and they're eating the parasites that otherwise would be a problem for the sheep. They're you know, putting nitrogen into the soil that's increasing the soil fertility. As the grass grows stronger, it's pulling more carbon out of the atmosphere and fixing it into the soil. They're reversing climate change. Now, are any of those things margin by conventional definitions? No. But those chickens are providing food security. They are providing uh, uh, deep, uh, nutrient-dense food. They're providing for all the local businesses that are involved with those chickens, whether it's the other farms that sell them, whether it's the people who come to the cafe to eat those meals, and the, the, the farm store, the feed store, all of that is all benefiting from the production of that. And they're providing all the foundation wealth of keeping that farm productive and pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and fixing it into the soil. Now, over here, I got some vacation rentals. They're going to cover the bills this winter, I got to tell you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So is there margin without mission? 
is their mission without margin? I can't answer that directly except to say there's mission in absolutely everything. And you just have to learn to see in my business, you have to learn to see where that margin is because I could say to my dad, get rid of it. You know, this isn't profitable. Let's get rid of that enterprise. Let's take it right off. But uh, you have to have a deeper understanding of the ecological cost of that, of the social cost of that before you can make that decision. So you have to have a broad definition of what margin is. Lisa, what Shannon just said is there can be and and probably should be mission in almost everything if we look for it. And yet we're having this conversation today about purposeful entrepreneurship, because at least in my opinion, it's still somewhat of a topic that people don't discuss or certainly don't embrace. Why do you think your average entrepreneur doesn't look to kind of purposeful entrepreneurship as the default? I think what we've been talking about with just so much conditioning around what is it to be an entrepreneur, what what qualifies success? I mean, that, that comes to mind. But I also think, you know, entrepreneurs are a rare breed. And I I my parents were entrepreneurs and they lost the farm, <laughs> if you will. So it made me really, really scared to become an entrepreneur or put it all our eggs in entrepreneurship basket because my husband has been an entrepreneur from day one. And so it's it's hard to it's hard to classify, right? Like just so many different people go into entrepreneurship and why they go into it. Um, so I can only speak to myself and what what I just have realized in this journey of, of being an entrepreneur for the past full time for the past eight years is that, well, I actually want to preface something too, before I say this, I had already reached a certain level of financial success before I started my business. So understand it's coming from that place. But what I thought was, is I was going to start the business and I was going to immediately take off just like all the other things I had done in my past career. And it was going to be easy because I had all this experience and all this knowledge and it was just going to happen. And it has been the complete opposite experience of that. And entrepreneurship was not the way for me to wealth in the traditional way of like, I just started making money. People started coming to me. It was all awesome. Like it was so much not that. And in the course of this past eight years, what I realized is the greatest wealth that I have gained from entrepreneurship is who I've become as a result of all the difficulties and the challenges that I would have never confronted had I not made this leap into this kind of unknown place. And and I think the reason it's so important to my own evolution is that I feel like I could hide who I really was not being an entrepreneur in the corporate world and just doing what other people said I had to do. But when I came into entrepreneurship and started getting into like, well, what's an, what are your values? Like, what really are your values? What do you really care about? Um, and, and separating that from how to make money, which is what I had to do that's where all the growth as a human being has come from in like separating, disconnecting from it all being about the money and starting like yesterday, this past weekend, I had something happen where someone introduced me um, to a very powerful business person who was really stuck in an, in a relationship issue. And so their coach was more in the capacity of helping them with business, but because I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I do breakthrough work. This person ended up with me, but it wasn't because the other coach thought I could help them. They just thought we, they got a hit that we should meet. Well, ultimately in the course of that discussion, I realized that I had information that could keep this person from like walking away from their family, walking away from the, like everything personal because it had gotten to this very tenuous place. And I said, allow me to help you if you want, but I don't want any payment in exchange. Like we're talking, this could be worth, you know, millions in value, but it was like this realization for me that there's so much more going on here. And when we get really, really clear about who we are and why we're here, it has nothing to do with money. It has to do with how can I be of service? And maybe I won't make money just back to what Shannon said for some parts of it, but 
other parts are taken care of. And to me, I didn't have that capacity several years ago. I thought it was all roads lead to money. I didn't understand the complexity of what's happening and how we become better humans in the context of, of giving and, and truly not caring about the money. We are talking to Encore Delight, who is the creator and host of the 10,000 Heroes podcast, Shannon Hayes, who is a PhD in sustainable agriculture and the author of Redefining Rich, and Lisa Peterson, who is a certified financial planner and creator of wealthclinic.com. We are going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to remind you, if you want to find out what is going on with the Earn and Invest podcast or me, Jordan Grummet, there are a few ways to get more information. One is that you can go to my personal website, jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. There you'll find links to my medical blog, my financial blog, as well as the Earn and Invest podcast. You'll also learn what is the newest, latest, and greatest when it comes to my book, Taking Stock, which will be coming out August 2nd. We're going to make the push for early or pre-sales in July. You can find it on Amazon, Books a Million, Barnes and Nobles. You name it, you can find it there. And last but not least, visit us on Facebook. The best way to get there is earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. Again, that's earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. In our Facebook group, we discuss everything from personal finance to current events to what's happening in our world, as well as I post every episode there. So check us out. A few different ways to reach me, either at jordangrummet.com or at earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. I hope to see you there and become part of the Earn and Invest community. Let me reintroduce you. We are talking to Anker Delight, who is the founder of the Holistic Leadership Club and has spent time as a hospice chaplain. Shannon Hayes, who holds a PhD in sustainable agriculture and is the proprietor of Sap Bush Hollow Farms. And Lisa Peterson, who has an MBA in finance from Cal State, and she's the author of The Mindful Millionaire. And we are talking about purposeful entrepreneurship. You know, I've had the experience of doing lots of interviews for my upcoming book. And the hot potato that everyone throws at me, because what I've written in this book is how do we find our purpose? So I want to throw that back at you, Ankur. Let me start with you. We're talking about purposeful entrepreneurship. You got to understand what your purpose is. How do we find that? Yeah, great. I love answering that question. That's that's part of my work in my coaching program. So so I love it. And there's, of course, there's you can you can find online, there's tons of techniques and blog posts and you know courses you can do but for me the essential way i think about it is especially for people who have lived a little bit people in their maybe in their 30s or beyond and i think it's different if you're if you're a teenager like if you're a teenager i would say you explore and you do random things that's what i did but once you once you've lived a little bit more i think you have data and so then what you can do is basically a kind of statistical regression where you look back over the data and you're like, okay, what was going on in all these different moments where I felt really me, where I felt really in tune, where I felt really in the flow, where I felt really joyful. And what are the similarities? You know, what are, what are the themes that run through that? So it's almost like a kind of detective or Sherlock Holmes exercise where you, pr- you pull up all this data. These are the moments that I felt really good. I felt really connected. I felt really excited. I felt like I was really being myself. What's common about that? There's this analytical exercise that you can do. And, and then you can pull out themes. And so that, that for me is like the first step. And I like to balance that with thinking, again, purpose is not, if purpose really is, and the, the, the conjecture here, and this is like a non-material thing, so it's a spiritual thing, so some people may have aversion to this, but I find it to be a helpful tool. The conjecture is that we're born with a sense of purpose. We don't know what it is. We have to discover it. It may evolve, but it, but the the idea is that like if if that's true, you know, which is kind of a wild idea in our modern, you know, mechanistic age. If that's true, then it's something that's too important to be fragile. It's something that can't be lost if I just like lose an arm in a car accident. So if I'm really good at ping pong, I'm right handed. I play a lot of ping pong. I'm like, oh, maybe my purpose is ping pong. I get in a car accident. I lose my right arm. 
Oh no, I've lost my purpose. I think it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more expansive than that. It's not something that can be so vulnerable to just like the body. So I guess the, the, the warning there is to try and find something that's not so abstract as to be meaningless and not to be so specific that every career change becomes a midlife crisis. So, like, I mean, let, let me ask you the question, Jordan, that you've, you've done a few different things in your adult career. You know, you had, you had this like whole medical phase and then you went into the financial planning thing and now you're balancing with this book. What, does, that, does that make sense to you? That, that your purpose would not be like, oh, my purpose is walking around hospitals. You know, that's too specific. Or my purpose is so abstract that, oh, all I do is help people, which might like anything could fit into that. Does that, does that resonate with you? It does resonate with me. You know, for me, I thought my purpose was being a doctor. I thought in a lot of ways, my purpose was helping people. What I eventually came to after a, a lot of really self-reflection is that being a physician only fit parts of my sense of purpose. And that's why it was very easy for me to become burned out in it. And more likely I was a communicator, someone who liked to engage people in complex conversations that said something about life, hence this podcast or public speaking or telling stories that drive home an idea. Those all became a much deeper part of my purpose and helped me understand why maybe early on in life, I either misidentified my purpose as just solely being a physician or that it fulfilled my sense of purpose for that time in my life. But I evolved and grew and changed. You know, it's interesting, Encore, because for me, purpose grew out originally of finding a job, finding a profession, and even finding a business within that profession and realizing that those weren't fulfilling my sense of purpose. Thankfully, they provided me financial means, which then gave me some of that freedom. Shannon, let's talk about entrepreneurship in general. For me, it did eventually lead to a sense of purpose. I didn't lead with purpose. I led with entrepreneurship and came to purpose. Shannon, how do you think entrepreneurship in general is a way of finding your purpose? Is it a good vehicle? Yeah. So um, I'm a little bit different from you. I live where I grew up. I remember being five years old, walking down the farm driveway and knowing my job is this place, this soil, this community. Um, my whole life, I just have known this. And what I was faced with is an area that um, when I was growing up, it was, it was in the farm crisis. And I always say that kids were being pushed off the land, like er weeds in the spray line of herbicides. We were just uh, told there was no future and suicide abuse, uh, uh, domestic violence, alcoholism was just rampant in the farming community. So I'm growing up in a farming community that's dying at the same time, uh, the community, uh, there were no jobs either. So my purpose, I knew my whole life, I, I have to be here. And what became very clear to me was the odds of me getting a job so I could contribute to the community were like one in a hundred. And then when you take someone like me, who's, I mean, there's government jobs and there were teaching jobs. That's about all because I really don't have it in me to be a doctor. Um, I could have gotten one of those jobs, but not really inclined. So there was nothing for me here. And yet I knew my purpose was here. So entrepreneurship was the only way. Um, my husband did get a job here briefly. He was fired for insubordination. So neither one of us had jobs. And so if your purpose is, well, I, I have to keep this farm going. We want to build this community. We want to make this place something that people value and care about and that people stop abusing, then entrepreneurship was the only way forward. Shannon, talk about that pivot moment. Because I remember I've heard you describe it before where you were very much in academia. And then you had a little bit of epiphany, maybe that reaching your final sense of purpose wouldn't yeah. continue with you staying in academia. Can you tell us about that specific moment? I don't know if it was the moment my husband got fired. But he had a job in county government. He was a planner 
and uh, his politics were not in line with county government stuff. I was on this career trajectory. I was going to become a professor, um, but uh, the ag school here was very into commercial industrial production, and my inclination was definitely not that way. And so he was fired, and I came home from grad school that weekend, and um, he made soup from a chicken carcass. Mm -hmm. And we sat by the wood stove, and we had soup, and we looked at one another, and we woke up the next morning, and there was snow on the ground. And uh, my parents were freaking out, telling us, well, we just bought this little cabin. You're going to have to sell. You're going to have to move. You're going to have to go find jobs. And we woke up in the morning, and we saw the land that we loved. We realized that we didn't have to go to jobs that day. <laughs> um, and that life could be something even more beautiful. And, and we just started, even with all those risks. But yes, we could not, uh, we were not welcome professionally with our backgrounds to uh, have conventional jobs. There was no other option other than to make our path by being entrepreneurial. Lisa, talk about how our vision of success changes when we become purposeful entrepreneurs, how maybe it doesn't necessarily align with, with a traditional entrepreneur. I think that there's some realization, even if it's not based in fact. So there's some realization that living in scarcity is no longer acceptable, right? So that's what I'm hearing from what Shannon was describing, because there was scarcity in those choices, but there was passion. Um, and so I just, I can't help but think that it's like this transition that we, we have to make for ourselves, that it's not going to be about just the money anymore. And when that shifts, when we kind of give ourselves permission to not be dictated by that, even if we still have to pay the bills. That's the fascinating thing about this. It doesn't have to just come because you have plenty of money. It can come from a shift in perspective that I'm not going to live from this way of thinking anymore. And I'm going to step into possibility, into opportunity, into what's on the other side. And it's so funny too, because I think we live in times where we're so wealthy as far as resources are concerned that we've lost perspective of like what, how easy it could be to make that shift. You know, for some people, they make the shift like, I want to, I want to follow my passion and I'm going to move back in with my parents, you know, even the whole family. Like I've come across people who have moved back in with their parents, the whole kids, everybody in order to bring something into reality because it's so purpose and mission driven that they're like, I can't do it anymore. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's just what's coming up, that there's this shift that we make. And when we make it, we're choosing to to live a more optimal life, even in the face of uncertainty, no longer allowing uncertainty to dictate the choices that we're making. Ankur, let's talk about another one of those shifts. Let's talk about how when entrepreneurs become purposeful, their leadership changes. Yeah, great. Okay, so here's the funny thing. I, I got into like the business entrepreneurship world just a few years ago. You know, I, I was trained as a mathematician and a computer programmer. I spent a lot of time working as an organic farmer, learning kind of sustainable agriculture all over the world, and a lot of time just meditating and studying and traveling. And when I got into the business world, I started hearing this word leadership a lot. And as far as I can tell, it's just code for spirituality that's palatable for business audiences. So when you, when you ask that question, I think, yeah, I mean, basically what it means is, as I think Lisa was saying earlier, we expand the, cell, the sense of what's important from just our, our small egoic notion of just taking care of myself to taking care of a larger community, the community of our employees, the community of our customers, the community of our investors. So when I was catching up on reading famous business books, I read this amazing classic book called Good to Great by by Jim Collins. And the first thing that comes out of that book is for him the classic level 5 leader, like like the the highest possible category of leader is essentially a spiritual teacher who identifies his own personal well-being with the well-being of everyone else in that person's ambit. 
And, you know, and this is like a, you know, a data driven research project looking at, I think, 12 or 20 years of performance. And he's like, oh, the companies that succeed are the companies that have CEOs who have this characteristic. And so that's their definition of leadership is really understanding that your needs are my needs and we're not really separate. So I, I think that's, that's essentially what it will look like. So as a final question, I want to ask each of you, this move from entrepreneurship to purposeful entrepreneurship, is this something that intuitively should happen, Shannon? Or is this something you actually have to go out and get coaching and get help learning how to become a purposeful entrepreneur? I think that depends on the individual. You mentioned at the top of this that I have a PhD and I kind of feel like the reason why I have a PhD is because it took me that long to figure out I could teach myself. <laughs> um, I know people who have dropped out of high school who are far more informed than I am and they didn't require the PhD. So it's a matter of charting your course and figuring out what's going to help you move ahead. We all have different paths that we have to take, and we all have to identify how we're going to get there. I think deciding that we're going on a different journey is important, whether it's you need coaching or you need to just spend some time with books or spend some time alone in the woods. Um, everyone is going to be different on that front. What I do want to say is taking that journey is so important. We talk about things that we need to save the world right now. We talk about uh, oh, we need better laws. We need better legislation and um, we need to recycle more. Uh, we need better performing cars. I think what we need in our communities are people who put small businesses in place and care about their people and care about the land that they're working with and the places where they are. Because when you do that, the whole well-being of the community improves. And the, the social science has proven this over and over again. And when the well-being of the community improves, we take care of the homes, we take care of the families, we take care of the land. And when we are all doing well, we can be kinder to each other. So I don't really care how you get on this journey, but if there is any inkling that you could be fulfilling your purpose by becoming an entrepreneur, please, please do it please get on that path. Lisa, what do you think some of the signs are that someone is stumbling and maybe could benefit from some coaching in this area? I think it depends on a person's level of self-compassion. And what I mean by that is a lot of folks are plagued with voices of limitation or harsh conversations going on inside of that voice that comes up. So when we lean into this idea of purpose, or we read a book, you know, of someone who was really living their purpose, we get excited. And then there's a voice inside, sometimes echoed by family members and other naysayers who come in and say, you can't make money doing that. That's a terrible idea, you know, trying to protect us with lots of love. But the problem is, and this is where I can answer your first question with my final <laughs> answer is mindfulness has been incredibly important to me at every single stage of the process because mindfulness allows us to see what's actually coming through that voice and what kind of conversations are happening inside of us and what we're susceptible outside of us. And I have found that this is such a personal decision that um, if those voices or the influences outside of ourselves are are not allowing us to realize how important it is, they will keep us stuck. So, you know, getting coaching or having a mentor or, you know, lots of different things that we can do help us to call out the things that are helpful and the things that aren't so helpful. So we can start to train ourselves to really be on purpose and be on target and the things that, you know, choosing what it is that we really want. Ankur, you coach people about purposeful entrepreneurship, people come to you, obviously, when they see that they need help moving in the right direction. Is, is there a big theme that most people come to you with, a, a big misconception that most people walk in your door with that inhibits them from getting where they want to go? Oh, def definitely. And it's, it's along the lines of this scarcity, but it's, it's really scarcity of imagination. It's, it's the idea that I cannot both fulfill my financial commitments to myself and my family 
and fulfill my desire for meaning and contribute to society. It's the idea that I have to choose amongst those things instead of I can, I can imagine a solution that encompasses all of those. Well, Shannon, Lisa, Anchor, I, I wanted to thank you for coming on today. As I thought about this conversation we've been having, you know, you can use the terms scarcity and abundance, or you can use the terms narrow and expansiveness. But clearly, when we think of the purpose of entrepreneurship as making money, as money being the central process, then we really are following in that kind of narrow and scarce mindset. On the other hand, when we redefine what wealth means to us to encompass that purpose, then we finally are living maybe that life of abundance and expansiveness that we've been looking for. And maybe it fits us a little better. I wanted to end this episode the way I end every episode by asking you what is up next in your life and where people can find you if they want to learn more. Shannon, let's start with you. What is coming next over the next few months? And specifically, if people want to reach out to you, how can they? Okay. Um, Well, what happens right now during the growing season is I do have the Hearth of Satbush Hollow podcast, which is chronicles and lessons from a life tied to family community in the land. And that is weekly storytelling about how we're doing things and what we're doing. Um, So do check into that every week. You can find me over at sapbush.com. You can read about the farm, the cafe, the vacation rentals, my kids who wait tables on roller skates and pull awesome latte art. Um, You can, you can see it all there. And uh, what I'm working on right now actually is uh, fiction and uh, working on the business, just the daily work of the business. But yes, I've been telling the story of my community for uh, in a novel for about 10 years and I have some quiet time. I'm focusing on that again. Lisa, tell us what is happening in your life. And specifically, if people want to reach out to you, how can they? So this summer, um, my company has grown quite rapidly in the past couple of years and with staff and with revenue. And what we're doing right now is allowing me to take a couple months off or as much as possible so that the team can learn about running things without me. So that's what we're in the process of beginning actually next week. So I'm super excited about that. And if someone wanted to learn more, the best way would be be to go to wealthclinic.com forward slash vision. And there you could uh, get a meditation that helps you focus on where might the scarcity be coming um, up in your life. And also the first chapter of my book, The Mindful Millionaire. And Ankur, tell us about your most excellent podcast and describe for us your coaching business. So the podcast is called 10,000 Heroes. The vision, of course, is social transformation through individual change. And so what we try and do is accompany people in their journey to their most heroic self to live their full potential. There's a few different aspects of that. There's discovery, which is kind of this process of understanding one's purpose we talked about today. There's imagination, which is like understanding how you want to fulfill that purpose and contribute to the world. And then, of course, I mean, you might call it realization, like actually execution, doing the work. But I like to call it persistence because it's not like the work is ever done. <laughs> so it's not it's not a binary thing where you just do it and it's done. Of course, it's, it's your life and your life is art. And your life is a work that's always going to be in progress until, of course, that day we all we all die. So that's what we help people with in the podcast is all those things. Uh, the coaching program is similar theme, but of course, much more intense engagement. We have a year-long coaching program. I run with two business partners who are also great friends and brilliant people. And we have a, a small cohort, you know, 100 people or less usually at any one time, go through uh, just all of that curriculum, but with a, a high degree of accountability. So the best way to get in contact is really just to listen to the podcast and engage so that, you know, I mean, I'm an old school email type guy. Info at 10kh.show is the best email. Of course, there is Twitter and all that stuff as well. But um, I'm, you know, the whole reason I'm doing this is I love being in touch with people, connecting, hanging out. We have an upcoming in-person event. It's our first one. And I'm just so excited about getting together with people in person, just really connecting deeply with them. And I hope to do more of that in the future. So that's something that's really exciting for me that's on deck. 
This has been the Earn and Invest Podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Shannon Hayes, Lisa Peterson, and Encore Delight. That's a wrap. Awesome. I leave the audio going just for a few minutes as we chat. So what didn't we talk about? Was there anything that you feel like we didn't touch on or that we weren't expansive enough about? I, I always just personally, I'm, I'm not used to this kind of panel format where it's just, it's so kind of quick and discontinuous. I, I just... I just wanted to hear so much more of everybody's stories. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, you started sharing about your, your journey, Lisa, and I was like, oh, I've got a lot of questions about that. Or the same <laughs> about, the, about the farm, like, oh, I want to hear more about it. <laughs> But that's just me. Yeah, it's, defi- it's definitely a different look. Um, where we do, it's it's kind of a melange of voices. And in fact, in some ways the idea is that it's almost like snippets of each person put together to tell a story as opposed to, although I do feel like sometimes in some panels and just at times it feels more like a running conversation. In some ways I do kind of like bringing those snippets together to eventually hopefully tell a story. Uh, But yeah, it's a different way of doing it for sure. Um, You can also, so I've done episodes with Shannon and Lisa, which go deeper into their stories. So you could also Mm -hmm. look them up on Earn and Invest where we, but you know, there's still some choppiness to it, but we go much deeper into each of their stories. Um, What was fun about this actually was thinking about you three together Um, because I think you're very different people who do very different things. And yet I think you share a lot of common ground in how you look at the world and certainly how you look at business. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Shannon, when you were explaining the the ecosystem and the ethos of like how you think about the farm, like I was like, oh, I want to bring this to my community. So I'm going to reach out because that was just like everything that I want to teach. But like this beautiful example of real life, like how it works and how it looks. So I, I really love that. And yeah, there were so many conversations I felt like could go deeper. Well, I'm really appreciative that we just got an opportunity to hear other minds. Um, With what I do, um, I I am very isolated uh, because the work is very outside. And um, if I'm not outside, I'm in the kitchen. And um, so I'm not connected a lot. So I really appreciate that you included me so I can hear some of the other thinking that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And go ahead. Where's the farm? Where do you live? I'm in the northern Catskill Mountains in upstate New York. Uh huh. Nice. It's very, very beautiful here. Oh, my my husband's a contractor and you know builds houses, but he would love to be farming. But he's also a little worn out from building houses for thirty years. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's see. part of your financial plan is you got to figure <laughs> out how to make sure, um, and and that's where farmers have. Uh, historically, they had that together. I always tell people, read Farmer Boy or go back even, there's a book, a children's book called The Ox Cart Man. Um, But both of those books really do explain um, how farmers were thinking because you've got your body, but you have to use your body and your mind in different ways. And uh, today in farming, we tend to think it's all body. And um, that really creates a problem when your knees start to go and your hips start to go and things like that. So you have to really look at that financial plan so that you can have that uh, (laughs) a balance in those things and take that time that you need for healing. Yeah, Shannon, you you've created the most succinct argument in my mind for what a modern day individual owned smaller farm can look like and, and, and makes a lot of sense today. Um, and I think if you talk a lot, a, a lot about a lot of city and suburb dwellers, uh, we couldn't, I couldn't imagine it until I heard you talk about it when I interviewed you. Mm-hmm. And, but I think it's a, a very, yeah, very rational 
well put together idea of, of how you've made your farm and your businesses work and, and provide that kind of wealth, as we were talking about, that's meaningful to you? I, I think um, one of the reasons for that is I'm defined by my landscape very much. So uh, number one cause of farm deaths around here was tractors rolling over on farmers because mm. the, the ground's like this. So we are physically limited. But on top of that, um, real estate prices are very high. So there are farmers who are making a living, selling a lot of product, growing a lot of organic food. Um, Encore, maybe, you know, Jill Salatin, for example, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. they, they really are incredible marketers and they are incredible at producing volumes and figuring out how to meet those demands. But um, I'm very limited by my landscape. And so I had to find a different path where um, I could make it work with, with, uh, with literal mountains <laughs> surrounding me. <laughs> and so the, the scale is much, much smaller. And also because it's very competitive around here for farming, um, the, the market is much smaller too. So I had to figure out something. So that's probably why it seems more realistic to you is I had to figure out on a much smaller scale how to do that. And I am not a superpower marketer. I just can't do the used car <laughs> salesman. Picture. I really, you know, there had to be a different route. Yeah. Which is interesting because I, I don't know, Ankur, about you and books, but I know about Lisa and Shannon is it's really hard to put a book out there without trying to put on that marketing cap, Ooh. right? Yeah. How are you doing and with that, I, Jordan? I, <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, I didn't even try. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, not even going to market my books. So I'm trying to understand how to embrace the power of taking something that's deeply important to you, a message and getting it to people without letting the fatigue of marketing change my excitement about all that. Right. So it's a mix. Like there are some people who love marketing who are going to just hit the ground running and do it in a way that I never could. Um, and then there's some people who despise it, who would do none of it. I'm trying to, again, kind of keep my intention set of this stuff is important to me. And if I want to get that, those words to people, I'm going to have to put up with some things that, that don't fit naturally, even if it's not tiresome, that don't necessarily always fit comfortably. Um, because as a lot of us, I don't love self-promotion, but you know, you give and take, right? You have to decide, you'd have to decide what, what gives you that sense of purpose. Give it and six months, important. you'll get to breathe again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I, I've been quite busy. I woke up with a little bit of a panic attack this morning when I realized how many different things I need to do over the next three months. But but these are all things of my choosing, which gives you slightly less of a panic attack because you're like, well, yeah. I created this out of joy and purpose. So yes, at the moment, it's feeling very busy and, and full, Um but there is not a thing I'm doing that I didn't say, oh, that's cool. I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. And and one thing that's nice that like if you're you're really tuning into this desire you have and this enjoyment of public speaking, you can choose the aspects of self-promotion that intersect yeah. with that. And not, yeah. you know, not yeah. you can you can you can avoid the ones that you don't like and you could focus on doing a lot of public speaking because that's yeah. Yeah. what you like. <laughs> 